So my name is Peter Beinart. I uh, have the pleasure of teaching here at, uh, at the Graduate Center and at um, the Journalism School. And um, uh, we're very, very lucky to be joined today by, to my left, Essie Cup, who's a, a CNN political commentator, uh, columnist for the New York Daily News, and also a writer for Glamour. Um, uh, Joy Ann Reed, who was originally scheduled to be here, had to be in London, but we are very, very lucky to have been joined by, uh, to be joined by Dean Obadala, who is the host uh, of the Dean Obadala Show on, on Sirius Radio and also the co-director of the comedy film The Muslims Are Coming, which you should definitely <laughs> see if you have not already. Um, um, so we have a lot to talk about. Um, I, I thought, um, let me see this, the reaction to this election, this election was not like other elections. Um, the reaction to this election has not been like previous elections. Uh, it's been, I think, much more personal for many people. Um, uh, so I, 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 for my own sake, on election night, I, um, I had a whole series of thoughts that don't generally cross my mind. Um, uh, um, uh, during American presidential elections, even ones where the candidate who I would like to win doesn't win, um, I ended up having a kind of poignant conversation with my 84-year-old year old father who remembered being 16 uh, in a small town outside of Cape Town when the National Party won in South Africa in 1948 and instituted apartheid. He hadn't talked to me about that in a long time. Um, uh, uh, um, and um, I was also... Um, I'm not used to being deluged by uh, anti-Semitism on Twitter, and yet um, that was also something that uh, happened in the Trump era, um, which uh, had an influence on my experience and made me feel um, perhaps insecure uh, and, and um, alien in a way that I, I maybe never had quite felt before. So um, on that note, I thought I would start with you, Essie, just by talking a little bit about what what it was and what it has been like for you as someone who was, um, to my mind, a very courageously anti-Trump voice as a proud conservative. Um, what, uh, it struck me at one point that you know, to be a conservative and now see that Trump has brought you both houses of Congress, if you're a never Trumper like you are, must be a little bit like you know, having an uncle who you hate who then gives you the biggest present ever. You know? um, so just tell me what it's been like for you. In a word, surreal, for many reasons. Um, as Peter said, and thanks for having me, nice to be with you tonight. Um, I am a proud conservative, was very much looking forward to supporting the eventual nominee of my party, was very much looking forward to running against Hillary Clinton for reasons that bared out, uh, bore out. But, um, and I had known Donald Trump, Personally, I know his kids. I liked him from a distance. I did not think he was going to make for a very good candidate. I was wrong. He <laughs> killed it. <laughs> um, in all the wrong ways, of course. And so I knew early on, maybe when he descended the escalator and talked about Mexican rapists, maybe then, maybe a little later, that I wasn't going to support him. Um, and I really didn't see him going very far. But as he felled all of my favorite Republican candidates, it started to become clear that this was real. There was something real here. And a lot of Republicans like me had maybe missed some of the anger and frustration and fear that we knew it was there. We didn't know how it was manifesting. And Donald Trump became a vessel for that. And for me, the project was to separate Donald Trump from the whole of the conservatism that I know and love. He never struck me as particularly conservative. I don't think he, know what that, he knows what that means. Um, and he shows absolutely no affection for the Republican Party. I don't, I don't think he cares about the future of the party. So I, know, I, I knew I wasn't going to vote for him. But my project going forward was at every turn, any way I could separate him from conservatism in the party. That's hard to do. When a lot of Republicans, friends of mine, ended up supporting him, 
Republicans in leadership ended up supporting him, even if begrudgingly, it's really hard to make the case that he does not represent my party right now. And so that going forward is going to be the difficult task for conservatives like me who do not want to be associated with Donald Trump's republicanism and think that he will be ultimately bad for our movement. At the same time, as Peter mentioned, very nice to have congressional majority and to hold that and to you know, take some state houses, to, to, to have this wave. Um, I'm very interested to see, obviously, as, as we all are over the next 100 days, um, where Donald Trump wants to take this momentum. Uh, lastly, on a personal note, the first thought I had when Donald Trump was elected was, I am definitely going to be audited, and audited huge. It's going to be painful. I might have to get a bunch of tax attorneys to help me out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's just... Um, you too, Peter. You too. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm not releasing my tax returns. I'm going to be fine. Um, uh, Dean, um, uh, you're progressive. Yes. Um, you are also um, a Palestinian American. Yes. Um, so um, uh, tell me what it was I'm also like. Muslim, so I'll be self-deporting. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, this, I've never had an election more personal in my life than this one in that the demonization of Donald Trump of the Muslim community was off the charts. I don't mean just the ban, the Muslim stuff. That was one thing. Before that, he said, thousands of Muslims cheered on 9-11 in New Jersey. They didn't. That came. Even Rudy Giuliani said that wasn't true. To saying Islam hates us, to saying less, more surveillance of Muslims, meaning less constitutional rights because of our faith, to saying things like, I'm not against ID cards, and then saying, we are hiding terrorists within our midst, which is, again, factually wrong, but it didn't matter. It was a scary, frightening election for many in my community. And the one good thing, the silver lining, if there was one, is that uh, people like SC, I really admire. I admired you before, but even more for your principal Republicans who said, I'm not going to stand with Donald Trump, even though he's a nominee of my party. Because my principles and my view of America is more important than just the GOP party, that he's the nominee, I thought was fabulous. I have conservative friends. I didn't have any before. I have some now. <laughs> Because we don't like Trump, so we agreed on that stuff, which was kind of cool. Um, it's been an alarming time, and I've written more about, I've written a lot about anti-Muslim stuff. I've written so much about anti-Semitism. I've never seen more in my adult life than in this campaign uh, online. I wrote about it for one for The Atlantic. In fact, I wrote one article for yours for The Atlantic. Uh, stunningly, the fact that we've seen this kind of emboldening of bigotry and racism and anti-Semitism that... I hope we didn't see. So, you know, after on the next day after election, I was getting hugs from people. A lot of, you know, my white liberal friends are like, oh, come here, it's gonna be fine. Uh, we'll keep in touch wherever, <laughs> wherever you're sent. And I'm an optimist. I hope the internment camp has free Wi-Fi. That's what I'm looking forward to at this point. Uh, but, so it's been, it's been stunning. It's been heartbreaking. On my radio show, people will talk about it later. People calling in and crying, not from my community, LGBT, anti-Jewish, uh, Mother today, it's been stunning. And, and I hope, I'm still hopeful that the history of the country says we'll move forward, but it's a stunning election. So, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you think Trump is going to interact with the Republican leadership in Congress. Um, obviously, he famously had a difficult relationship with Paul Ryan. Um, um, what do you think, um, what do you think the, the, the interaction between him and Ryan and Mitch McConnell is going to be like? And what do you think is going to come out of it? This was always the question, who was Trump going to be? Which Trump would show up? Because we had seen a number of different versions of Donald Trump on the campaign trail. There was the former Democrat, who sometimes answered questions more like Hillary would. There was the authoritarian, who seemed to have very little affection for big things like the Constitution. Um, you know, Congress, separation of powers, Geneva Convention, who needs it? Um, that was a very scary prospect. But then there's, of course, Trump, the deal maker, right? Who has absolutely no guiding principles about anything other than where's the win? Get me from A to B, B being the win. I think that case, the latter, is actually the best possible scenario. 
that he is not tethered to any scary ideological principles, whatever side of the aisle you're on and whatever that means to you, and that he's gonna look for the wins. And I think he's gonna do that with Democrats. He voted for them for years and donated to them, friends like Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. I mean, these are literal friends of his. And I think he's gonna do that with Republicans as well. I think he'll have a hard time, less of a hard time with Paul Ryan, more of a hard time with like, I don't know, some of the Lindsey Graham, John McCain. Um, there's some scorched earth there. But look, you've got a very vocal Freedom Caucus and Tea Party conservatives who were really sick of the way things were, were being done before. So if that's the Donald Trump that shows up, I'm actually, I'm actually optimistic that we can get some stuff done in ways we haven't before because everyone comes in with their baggage. Years and years of political enemies and baggage and here's what I want and here's what you didn't give me and so I'm gonna, there's none of that with him. He is a clean slate. Um, that's, that's what I'm hoping, that's what I'm hoping happens, but best case scenario. So can, what do you think are a couple of things that you think might get done either with Republican support or with Democratic support? I think infrastructure would be an obvious place to start. Um, that might not sound sexy, but you know, this is the sort of thing where a win begets a win begets a win begets a win. And so you gotta start somewhere. I work a lot on uh, Syrian foreign policy and with, with various groups. And I'm maybe optimistic that on Syria because Donald Trump's main interest, at least while he was campaigning, was no refugees. Uh, maybe we can pressure Congress and the Trump administration for, for safe zones because the humanitarian and practical thing to do if you don't want Syrian refugees is to give them a safe place to return home to. And because Bashar al-Assad and Russia is bombing nurseries and hospitals, that's why they're pouring out. So I, I, I would like to see um, a foreign policy win, whether that's political, diplomatic, or military, um, come early. And I'm optimistic that might be a place where he would have some agreement on the right, maybe even on the left. Uh, Dean, I wanted to ask you about the, the sources of Trump's support. So you know, there's a big debate that went on throughout the campaign and since the election about how much of it is uh, racism or sexism or some form of, of kind of cultural resentment and how much of it is just the legitimate frustration of folks for whom the economy is really lousy and feel like their communities uh, don't have any economic hope and so they've just lost faith in the system and they're gonna vote for the guy who's gonna blow it up um, and, 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 and that includes not vast numbers but some numbers of Latinos and, and uh, you know, even a few African Americans as well, and, and some people, some white people who voted for Obama, right? So, um, uh, so I wonder, again, as someone who talks to a lot of folks on the radio, and what's, how do you make sense of the sources of Donald Trump's surprising support? Well, well, first of all, I'll say honestly, I do not think any stretch of the imagination that every Trump supporter is a racist or a bigot. I do not believe that at all. I do think if you are a racist or a bigot, Donald Trump's the person you might like to support. You're not gonna go like, oh, you know, I, I hate Muslims, but I really like Jill Stein and her recycling plan. No, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> You're gonna go for Donald Trump. Within the Trump constituency that supported him, I have no doubt there are people, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, just out of jobs. Their lives are not working out. And him, Donald Trump, was viewed as a lottery ticket, I think, to some of these people. The same way, Obama in 2008 was viewed messianic to a lot of us. We all saw something in President Obama. We're like, this guy's gonna do this or that. And it wasn't economic, it wasn't cultural issues. It was more like, you know, dream and hope and yes we can, that kind of stuff, and we saw that. I cannot tell you what percentage of Donald Trump supporters truly hate Muslims or don't like Latinos or black people. I can't tell, or, or don't like Jews. I don't know the answer to that. I think time will tell. I am troubled that 65% of GOP voters supported a Muslim ban. I'm troubled that a strong majority of Republicans did not think Donald Trump calling Judge Curiel, the judge born in Indiana, uh, a Mexican, and say he shouldn't preside over the case. A majority did not think that was racist, while a majority of Americans thought it was racist. So there's something within there uh, that is very, very troubling. I was really gonna, like, I have a radio show. I'm like, we're gonna take the high ground. Hillary's gonna win and we're gonna reach out and we're gonna heal America. Now, I still want to heal America. I just right now have to heal me first. 
and then we can and then heal other progressives and then reach out and heal other people because ultimately I believe that Americans are good people and I believe the loudest voices often are the most racist sexist people the, the people just sitting at home just want their lives to be better so they're not getting out there we write about the most loud racist bigoted voices because they're the ones that scare us but most people aren't like that we know that so and I guess there's some sense, even though it doesn't matter in the election, that Hillary won now by it's over 800,000 votes the last time I saw it. Maybe it can get to a million. You know, it's, it's interesting that she could win by a million votes and not be president. That's kind of stunning, but it, the, the feel-good part is that a million more people wanted her than him. So if you are concerned about bigots and racists and stuff like that, at least we have this kind of, he didn't get a mandate, let's put it that way. So I, I'm troubled, but the same question you have, I've gone through my head a lot, how much is out there that's really hate, and how much is economic opportunity. I think the only way to reach people is to be respectful of those who, who need economic help, whose lives haven't worked out. They played by the rules and things have not moved ahead. As long as they're respectful of us, and I look like a white guy, but I'm a minority and identify as a minority, respectful of our real concerns, that black lives do matter, that being Muslim is challenging, there is a thing called Islamophobia, there is anti-Semitism, you know, being sexist is not the right thing. They have to at least be respectful of that view. They don't have to agree with me on it, but at least be respectful of those things, and perhaps we can find some common ground. That's my hope. I see, I'm interested in how you respond to that. I mean, it seems to me a lot of conservatives feel, at least conservatives I know, feel that they get, ra get called racist at the tip of a hat, unfairly, and that there's a problem with political correctness, however defined, which prevents people from dealing with sensitive subjects in the way that, you know, um, and yet are also, um, genuinely, maybe genuine, like you are disturbed by some of the things that have come out of the Trump campaign. So how do you think about where that line is between um, a legitimate conservatism that is uh, non-racist uh, and, 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 and doesn't deserve to be called that, um, but, but may make liberals uncomfortable and, and where Trump has gone? Uh, well, I think that's going to be the story of this election. Um, in, in many ways, I, I, I take that back, there's gonna be a thousand stories of this election, but that's gonna be a big one. Um, my friend, Crystal Ball, I don't know, that is her real name. I don't know <laughs> if, you've, uh, if you're familiar, she's a progressive, I had a show with her on MSNBC once, she's a very, very close friend of mine. Recently wrote in HuffPo, the Democratic Party deserves to die. And what she meant by that, and she unpacked it in a very lengthy and excellently written piece, she said, look, all of the things that Dean was talking about, people just not feeling like their lives are working out, they're playing by the rules and it's not, it's not working out. How did Democrats over the last eight years respond to them? They said, well, we're gonna take your jobs, but we're gonna give you retraining programs for new jobs that don't exist. And then they scolded them about their white privilege. These are her words. What did Republicans do? Well, we gave you Donald Trump. Which message do you think is going to resonate better if you are a disaffected, aggrieved person who feels disenfranchised and, and left behind, unheard? Right or wrong, Donald Trump was more effective at speaking to those people than the Democratic Party had been. I like to believe that the Democratic Party's messages were certainly more nicely packaged but Donald Trump resonated. And so there needs to be a good, hard look on the left at how we got to this place just as much as on the right. And I'm not saying we don't need to do that too and how we got to Trump. Um, but when it comes to race and all of these isms, sex, sex, sexism and <clears throat> Uh, xenophobia, all of these things that became, came, sort of came out of the shadows um, thanks to Trump and also thanks to his collaboration with Breitbart. I mean, the, the, the Breitbart alt-right stuff I had known about for a long time, but it was really a fringy, dark web kind of thing that Trump gave a huge platform to. And so now it kind of seems like it's ubiquitous. And it's, it's not. The alt-right view is still a, a very minority viewpoint within the conservative party and within the country, but because Trump put its CEO in the White House, 
it really does feel like that is everywhere now. Um, you want to just take a moment to define, maybe not, not everyone is familiar, what you mean by alt-right? Yeah, it's, it's this very ugly, troubling, anti-Semitic, uh, homophobic, sexist, bigoted, white nationalist, nativist uh, project, social project, that really didn't have much of a safe place before Trump came in. And Breitbart was that safe place, but Breitbart was not a, a, a huge, hugely credible entity. Um, if you were one of those people in the past, you were tweeting anonymously from an egg in your basement. You don't have to be an egg anymore <laughs> because Donald Trump has sort of given you permission to have these feelings. And the problem with political correctness, and it sounds like conservatives are obsessed with it and we're whining about it all the time, but this is why. Because in a world where everything is offensive, where you need safe spaces on college campuses to have a you know, troubling conversation that might get heated, where you know, gender pronouns could be trigger warnings. In a world where everything is offensive, Donald Trump came in and created a world where nothing is offensive. He can literally say anything about anyone and people will defend it because they think this is standing athwart to political correctness. It's not, he's just a jerk. But because political correctness has gotten to such a zenith or nadir, as I, I would uh, put it, this backlash has turned the world upside down. And it's crazy because now people get away. I, quick anecdote, and then get off me. But yesterday, I get a tweet from some alt-right Trump supporter that says, why would we believe Essie Cup, a transgender who isn't a real conservative? I thought that was really interesting. I retweeted, I'm transitioning. <laughs> He tweeted back, really? Because you look 100% like a woman. And I said, no, I'm a dude. Just don't tell the child I birthed a couple years ago. <laughs> Apparently, some people on Twitter were like, dude, she, she's a woman. And he wrote back, tweeted back, I guess I got some wrong information. I heard you were transgender. He wasn't he was being rude, but he also really believed this. He wasn't just saying, I'm a woman who looks like a man. He really believed somewhere that I was transgender. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm not. And I said, he, and he said, I'm sorry. I don't know where I got that. I really didn't mean to get personal. From now on, I'll just um, disagree with you about your politics. I said, okay, deal. And I just thought, like, that was so crazy, weird, but reassuring <laughs> in some ways, that if you talk to some of these people who are just, I mean, programmed right now to just slap at you in the way that Trump, you know, slaps people around, if you talk to them, it's, they're disarmed a little bit. And I think that's encouraging and what I hope, that even though everyone's very angry and frustrated and, aside from Trump supporters, fearful and anxious, we don't stop talking to one another. I think the biggest lesson of this crazy election is we stopped talking to each other a long time ago. So we didn't know who Trump supporters were. We didn't know who Bernie progressives were. We need to keep talking to each other and figure out where we're coming from so we don't get surprised again. Uh, do, you, do you think, I want to fo follow, continue with this. Do you think that progressives like yourself and myself bear any responsibility for um, being too quick to to throw around terms like racist, sexist, homophobe, whatever, in a way that, you know, because sometimes, I'll be honest, you know, sometimes in some ways it is easier than engaging in a lengthy policy conversation. And the norms of what's considered to be sexist or homophobic do change, right? So, you know, a lot of people will say, wait a second, I'm against gay marriage. That used to be Barack Obama's position. Now I'm a, a homophobe. I, the culture is changing, right? A lot of Americans... On, on, you know, in terms of rights of transgender people, right? For a lot of Americans, that was a very, very new thing, right? And they're saying all of a sudden, 
Before, you know, up until Tuesday, I never heard of this issue really very much in where I'm living. And now all of a sudden, if I don't support people being able to use whatever bathroom I want, I'm a, I'm a bigot. And, 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 and so there does seem to be a lot of resentment uh, um, of that. Um, on the other hand, um, there's also something which is very disturbing about it. So I wonder, what is the responsibility of progressives in this moment to talk about this in a way that really does call out the truly hateful, disturbing stuff, but also creates an open dialogue with people who at least themselves don't consider themselves bigots? I think that's a great question. I've called you a bigot several times. Just, you know, <laughs> I've never called him a bigot. Although Woody Allen said, I'm a bigot for the left. And I always liked that when Woody Allen said that in the one movie. And the idea that, yeah, we can be bigots, but we're for the left, so we're progressive bigots, so somehow it's better. Yeah, there are I always, some... I always love it when people... I've often sometimes been called a self-hating Jew, and I always think, you know, I know so many Jewish people who don't like other Jews, but I, I don't know any who don't like themselves, you know? Um, That's a whole different thing, right? But anyway, go ahead. Uh, look, yeah, there's definitely going to be some liberals who knee-jerk and call someone who made a policy point a bigot or a racist or homophobic or Islamophobic to shut them down. There, there's probably no doubt about that. I don't know how many people in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania, key states Hillary had to win, voted for Donald Trump because they were upset someone was politically called out PC stuff to them, or they voted for Donald Trump because their lives are not going well and the factory closed down. There's not new jobs being created. At least that's my hope because this PC stuff to vote on that it's almost more like a talking point on a, on a panel at CNN. We'd say, your PC is too much. Um, political correctness, depending on how you define it, is a good thing. Let's be honest. The idea of being respectful of people, of being empathetic, of actually caring about other people's feelings and the, what the terms you use, understanding your words mean something. There's nothing wrong with that. When it's taken too far, and I'm also a stand-up comedian, where it's taken too far, where if I'll do a joke in a show and it's clearly not in any way hateful, and sometimes even making fun of myself, and someone comes up out of college and goes, I thought that was inappropriate. I don't go to them like, you're a jerk, you don't know, you're, like, let's talk about it. We talk about it. And we find, I try to find out where it's coming from. You know, Essie said something I really like, that story about the, the Twitter person. I get tons of email, like, go back to your country, which is New Jersey. So <laughs> I get all like, go back to your, I'm like, I'm born in Jersey. Do I really have to cross the bridge for this conversation? I'm like, I'll just stay here, I live in Manhattan. But I get things, I recently had a guy email me typical thing, like you're a Muslim dog, all this stuff, right? And he said something, and a lot of times I try to have fun with them. Instead of responding in anger, I respond comedically. And I said something to him, I can't even remember what exactly it was. And he responded to me, he's like, I can't believe you answered my email. <laughs> he was like, he goes, and then he goes, I'm sorry, I just use this language to get people's attention. And he actually said, Donald Trump taught me to do this. And then I said something back to him and he goes, yeah, he goes, well, let's hope everything goes well for our country. And the, but the point is that often in America, I feel now when we disagree politically, we're not fellow Americans, we're enemies. Like you view someone on the other side of the issue as your enemy and you're going to fight them as opposed to any chance of finding common ground. I think that's endemic in, in the hyper-partisan world we live in, both sides, Democrats, Republicans. You know, Breitbart's horrible stuff. They've written articles about me, like Pam Geller's written articles about me just doing comedy stuff, like I'm running a stealth jihad to take over America and I'm trying to post Sharia law through comedy. And she said it seriously, that's the funny part. She really said this. And you're like, what's going on in this world where you have people who, and like 20,000 people will share the article. I'm like, oh my God, what is going on there? Um, so I think if there's a healing process for the future, if I can tell my fellow progressives, don't use these terms right away because because conservatives, those are trigger words from conservatives. I know they hate trigger words. That's a trigger word for them. Mm -hmm. You call them a bigot. They're like, oh, oh, do you a bigot? And then they start saying things. You're a libertard. They, they call me a libertard all the time, which is a combination of liberal and retard, you know, because they're, they're so clever. Um, <laughs> I get that a lot. So I think it's about listening to each other finally. Exactly what you're saying. It's about hearing each other and trying it. We're not going to reach everyone that way, but we're, what got us to this point, I think, is not listening, is shutting people down. And lack of empathy. I think we have an empathy gap in this country I've never seen. And on the left, they go, it's all the right. I bet on the right, they're going, it's all the left. So maybe there's something through that about actually listening and being empathetic and having progressive not shoot people down right away. Let's have those discussions. It may be five or six tweets, and then you're like, okay, you're a bigot. But at least, <laughs> at least start the conversation because I think we're going to reach some people. As, as a conservative, do you think that Bernie Sanders would have done better against uh, Trump? Better. Don't think he would have won. 
but you can't argue with the enthusiasm gap between Hillary Clinton and, and Bernie Sanders. And what I don't, what I still can't believe is that Democrats, and I mean operatives, not voters, but Democrats in the party put blinders on when it came to Hillary Clinton. I mean, you could, oh. Okay. Any outside observer or Republican could easily see the flaws in her candidacy. I mean, she came in with baggage, and I mean bags upon bags upon bags. Um, unfavorables, she was not liked. Uh, we'll have time for a question. Go ahead. Do you want, can I finish my point? Thanks. Um, if you're just looking at her without the lens of like making history and without the lens of getting Hillary Clinton to the White House and this project that really Democrats had obsessed over, you would never promote this person to, to you know, get the nomination. You just wouldn't. But I really think Democrats, again, I mean party, thought the laws of gravity and physics just would not apply and she could sort of uh, bend space and time. And ob obviously that, that didn't happen. And I think, um, I think it, virtually anyone would have done better than she did um, against Donald, Donald Trump or, or lots of other candidates. But also, I think... Uh-oh. Look what you've done, Essie. Uh, all right, we have some divisions no, we're, we're, in the room. That's fine. Here to have a civil conversation. Um, you're allowed to disagree. That doesn't bother me at all. Um, but I think someone like Joe Biden, for example, and we all know and understand and respect why he didn't run, but the, the deficiencies Clinton had demographically were older, blue-collar, white men that have been fleeing the Democratic Party. Joe Biden speaks that language. Um, Bernie Sanders-ish, but to no degree that Joe Biden really speaks that language. And frankly, it's why she tapped Tim Kaine, to fill that hole. I don't know, he wasn't a terribly compelling vice president, and people don't vote based on your vice president. But that's where the Democratic Party, I think, on the ground was, Joe Biden. They just weren't in enough numbers where Hillary is. And I think, like I said earlier, Democrats really need to sort of reconsider um, how they relate to not people just on the coasts, not minorities, millennials, and women. Tick all those boxes, you're doing great. Everyone else. Um, in the middle of the country. If you want to surrender all of those people, Don Donald Trump's going to win again. And, and on my side, we, need, we have the opposite problem, of course. And so I think this is a remarkable time for introspection on both sides of the aisle, for both parties. So can I just push back a little bit? I mean, I would agree with you that I think Hillary Clinton is not a compelling public speaker in the way that Elizabeth Warren or Barack Obama or, uh, or Bill Clinton are. Um, and, um, uh, and I personally have my own, I was not, I think her record on Iraq and Libya were troubling to me given my foreign policy views. Um, but I think that, um, I think Biden, you know, who's a lot, could be pretty fast and loose with the truth. Remember going back to 1988, might have oh, yes. had his own issues. But, but I guess to push back a little bit, we know that a, a, a remarkably high percentage of Americans said that they thought she was dishonest and untrustworthy, as high as with Trump, virtually. Um, and yet, these objective metrics, like PolitiFact, right? PolitiFact, I looked, said that 26% of her statements were some version of false. That was actually even better than Bernie Sanders, and Trump was at like 70%. So do people, those of, do people in the media bear some responsibility for, for portraying an exaggerated version of, you know, the idea of Hillary Clinton is this kind of moral monster, this person who can't say an honest thing, when, you know, when she actually, you know, again, by some of these objective metrics, you know, she had a pretty decent record in terms of saying things that were true. Right. Great defense. Well done. Um, yes. <clears throat> but at the same time, it wasn't just 
her uh, honesty and trustworthiness. That was a big part of why her uh, unfavorables were record high. It was also these stuff that happened before the election, the intermingling of the official and the profitable that follows the Clintons wherever they go, whether at the State Department, CGI, the foundation, the... Come on, guys. We, we, no interruptions, please. We're going to have time for questions. It's not, it's not respectful. Go ahead. Um, was deeply concerning to people. And there was, a, I think, unusual level of opacity around that intermingling that bothered people on, on a cerebral level. Uh, people who hated Hillary hated Hillary from their gut, and nothing was going to change that. But on a cerebral level, I think people had real concerns about all of the arms uh, that that the Clintons had, their Wall Street speeches. What what was she, you know, what was being curried um, for for some of this stuff, and and her friends, uh, you know, overseas. And there was just, I, I think that sowed a lot of concern that Hillary Clinton was not going to be accountable to anyone. I mean, she made a promise if she was going to be Secretary of State, she would disclose all of the foreign donations to the foundation. She didn't do that. There just seemed at every turn to be a, a lack of interest. I won't say every turn. A number of important pivot points, a real lack of interest in being accountable like everyone else. So you can, uh, you're absolutely right on the facts. But there is a perception that supersedes these facts that when built together just made her a very damaged candidate the second she announced her, uh, her run, I thought. I want to ask you kind of a version of this because what's interesting well, is we, that some of what Essie's saying is true. Right, exactly. I mean, Glenn Greenwald, right. Perception is Glenn Greenwald believes some of what Essie said, right? So what's interesting, there's a, there's a split between liberals and the left, right? Whereas liberals have ten tended to argue that this was conservative stuff that was kind of, you know, mountain out of mold hill. It was, um, and, but there were people further to the left who said, no, we really do think she's in bed with a certain kind of economic establishment that we think is selling out, you know, selling out people with uh, too close to Wall Street, et cetera. So I mentioned where you come down on that. I mean, what I'm saying about SE being correct, I'm saying in perception of people, that's what the polls showed. Is it really true? I don't think so, but that's life. I supported Bernie in the primary. I was not anti-Hillary, I just liked Bernie a little more. Then I was 120% for Hillary. I spoke to young groups of color. I've talked to Muslim groups who say the same things SE is saying. To me, there were young Bernie people, and they're like, well, we can't trust her. And we'd go through it, and I'd give them the facts, and I still couldn't move them because in their mind, it was, it was drilled in. They were taught by the media or by their own perception of facts or the two together, you can't trust Hillary Clinton. And it, it was very painful. I think Donald Trump is a criminal, to be quite blank. I think he's a criminal. And I think he's going to self-deal in the White House, and I think he's going to leave the White House in handcuffs. That's what I honestly think. This is a guy who won't give his tax returns, who screwed off small... I used to be a lawyer. I was a lawyer 15 years ago at a New Jersey firm. We were representing small contractors he had screwed over who were going to do a RICO lawsuit against him. Why did he do it? Because he knew he didn't have to pay the small businessman because they could never afford to sue him. This guy then surrounded himself with Steve Bannon and, and the bigotry and the racism and being endorsed by David Duke. The Donald Trump's a man who would call Elizabeth Warren a fraud and a racist but would never say that about David Duke publicly. That's the kind of person we're dealing with. So I despise, I've never hated a candidate for president like I hated Donald Trump. It was personal. I didn't hate Mitt Romney. I, didn't, I wasn't going to support him. I didn't hate John McCain, that's for sure. I wanted Barack Obama. I never hated him. Even I never hated George Bush, really. Cheney, yeah, maybe. But, <laughs> but, but Donald Trump is different, and we all feel it. So we're stunned. How can our fellow Americans not see it? Because they were balancing between these two binary choices for the most part. And they're like, well, I don't trust Hillary in their mind, and Donald Trump is saying something that moves me. And maybe he will give a chance to create jobs, because Hillary has not created jobs. Somehow, a Secretary of State is supposed to create jobs in Wisconsin, and I don't know how either, but it still it resonated. That's the bottom line. Just a teeny bit. Look at Michigan. I think it just went Trump officially, what, like 10, 12,000 votes. Wisconsin, a little bit more, about 200,000. Pennsylvania, small numbers could have tilted this whole election. Florida, 1% tilted the election. But SC's completely right on the perception. That's not the reality. I mean, that's the weird. So we're living in the world of perception. We work in the media. I think the media is horrible. 
I, I have never been more frustrated with the media in my life. And I work, I write for Daily Beast, I write for CNN, I beg producers to cover stories from different points of view, I can't get them to do that. I'm lucky I have a radio show, but it's only like 56 minutes a day, I don't think I can make that much of a dent on it. But our media was about ratings. Let's, let's move this from CBS said it best, that Donald Trump is not good for America, but he's good for ratings. The bias is not left or right, the bias is ratings. That's what they're, they're businesses. We can't ask them to be more, that's what they are, they're businesses. So if you don't like businesses, if you care about the real truth, you have to find your own sources of information from people like Amy Goodman, who's great, I like Amy Goodman, to you know, people who are like WBAI or it's NPR, anything these places. Dino Bidala show Series XM noon to one o'clock, that kind of place like that. So um, see, I wanted to just before we get to questions, I wanted to also obviously another ma major theme uh, of this election was gender. And there were it was a very, very interesting and and painful um, kind of cultural moments around uh, all of these revelations about Donald Trump. Um, and um, I wonder if you think that it has had or will have a lasting cultural impact. The, 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 the first female, the potential first female president losing a man uh, accused, it seems to me, uh, quite uh, legitimately of, uh, of sexual assault, nonetheless prevailing, um, more women, it seems, some high-profile cases of women being willing to come forward in the wake of this. Um, what, what do you think the cultural impact is going to be in terms of gender dynamics as a result of this campaign? Well, my worry about Trump generally is that he seems to have, at least in the short term, and I hope not in the long term, normalized a lot of really terrible, awful behavior and rhetoric. So. You know, you've all seen the pictures of women Trump supporters saying, you know, he can grab me, you know where. Women! And men, some in elected office saying, well, that's just how guys talk. That's not how guys talk. And I don't want people, I don't want my son to grow up thinking that's how guys talk. And my dad never talked like that. And my husband doesn't talk like that. And so I worry that Again, what I said about political correctness, this everything offensive, now nothing is offensive. I worry that that really does stick around. And he'll have a lot of control over that. Now that he's uh, president, how is he gonna talk to world leaders about them on Twitter, in Congress? How is he gonna talk? How is he gonna talk in a press conference? How is he gonna talk in an interview? Um, you know, toothpaste is out of the can at this point, but at the same time, if he sets a new tone, maybe some of that stuff erodes, but I worry that there's this new era where you can talk like that under the auspices of patriotism or under the auspices of manliness. Um, that's deeply disturbing as a woman, but also really just as an American, as a person. I mean, Trump called me terrible things um, publicly on Twitter. Loser, she should be fired, talentless, other stuff. And plenty of other women too. I'm a, a public person. That's okay, that's, you know, it's not okay, but it's, it's, that's what it is. But the idea that we're gonna talk to each other like this, and I've already seen it on Twitter. I mean, I'm not Jewish, but I get Holocaust pictures sent to me saying this is where you're gonna go. Um, you know, for not supporting Trump. So there's, there's a grossness around, around gender right now because she lost to him. Um, so I, again, I just, I just hope we don't carry that out in the way we talk to one another or yell at each other impolitely because he yells at each other, he yells at people impolitely. I hope that we remain civil, and uh, like I said earlier, talk to one another so we hear each other more. And, and Dean, what is the cultural impact gonna be on American Muslims? I mean, how is this going to in shape American Muslim identity? It's hard to say, because look, it hasn't been a bed of roses up until now, folks, for us. So <laughs> like, well, things have been great, and now Trump's gonna make it worse. It's not been good for years for us, which has given us a thicker skin. It's made us more resilient, you know, I was giving pep talks to my white liberal friends after Trump lost. And I'm like, guys, we've been through this a lot. I mean, and I, and I wrote an article for Daily Beast that my Muslim pep talk for fellow progressives, 
And, and the bottom line was I said, look, we lost. We're not defeated. Right. Keep that in mind. We're not going to cower in the shadows. We're not moving to other countries. We're not surrendering. We're never, ever going to surrender. We're going to fight now more than ever. And we're going to build allies. And the Muslim community just yesterday announced ISNA, which is a big Muslim group, announced a big alliance with a major Jewish organization that they had worked with before, but never formally. And because Jews and Muslims are keenly aware we're both minority faiths in this country now, for the worst reason for Jews, you, don't, you might not have been aware of it as much to this election, to be honest. So we have that. You had both CARE and the ADL put out statements denouncing Steve Bannon within hours. They were, last night, the head of the ADL and CARE were on, on Chris Hayes' show back to back. I wish they were on together, but it was still, but they're working together. And so I think it's going to be us forming alliances, working, reaching out to people beyond our community, trying to build alliances of really good people. I mean, Martin Luther King said that we have finite setbacks, but we don't give up infinite hope. That's something to keep in mind as progressives. And the future is brighter if we work together. And I've been begging people of all backgrounds. There's a great quote. I love Martin Luther King. It inspires me a great deal. To paraphrase one quote, he said, the greatest tragedy is not the strident clamor of the bad people. It's the appalling silence of the good people. So if you're a good person, you see hate against people who are not in your community. If they're Jewish, if they're Muslim, they're LGBT, women, whatever group, speak out. Don't let silence has never cured any social ill in our country's history. So speak out. Speak out respectfully at first, then turn it up a little. But at the beginning, turn up, be really nice. And I think we have to talk to each other more. Like Essie is saying, it seems trite, but I think we haven't tried that in years. So let's try that. It's the simplest thing. Let's have conversations. I have so much respect for conservatives now, like, like you. I'm, I liked you before, don't get me wrong. I wasn't like, I didn't like Nessie Cup. You know, I wasn't retweeting Trump stuff. I'm like, yeah, I agree with you. No, it was. But now I think we can find some alliances. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for the future. You know, uh, just on that point, um, after the election, a white, liberal, woman, gay friend of mine who lives in Brooklyn of course. said, obviously, by they mandate, have to live there, right? by mandate, she had no choice, right? Um, said, Essie, do you know of any groups of left right women who meet to sort of talk about politics politely? And I was very sad to say, no, I don't. But it sparked an interest in her to sort of put something like that together because she said, I never met a Trump supporter, I didn't think there were any around. Clearly, there were enough to make a difference. And I think the positive thing out of this was not that she wants to go and, you know, yell at a Trump supporter. She wants to talk to a Trump. She wants, she wants to understand a, a woman who could vote for Donald Trump. Good luck. But that's, that's her project now. And I think that's really encouraging. And I think we have to realize together, all of us, collectively, we should be more interested in looking for converts than heretics. And that has not been our project on the left or the right. I, you know, for, for, for liberals and progressives, I, th I think it's amazing that I am your enemy. That's crazy. <laughs> we need to come together in, in, in ways that can sort of reshape the conversation. Because I think we care about a lot of the same stuff. Um, and to sort of shake down someone who's kind of on your side, if not on the policy, but on the politics, I think is a, kind of a, a real oversight and missed opportunity. Can I just say one quick thing? On my radio show, I had two conversations with the recent Trump supporters, because I always tell them it's judgment-free call-up, I'm always going to be respectful and civil. And one guy said, I want this Muslim ban, right? And I'm Muslim, and he knew all that. So instead of me getting mad, and I always promise I wouldn't, I go, why? And he goes, I just want my family safe from terrorism. And to him, that was the only approach there was that was there. He didn't hate Muslims. He's just afraid for his family. If you find out the why, not the headline, the headline is I support Trump, but beneath that, the why is where you find common ground. I want my family safe from terrorists too. And we have a reasonable conversation. Maybe we can explain why the Muslim ban won't work um, and what we can do that perhaps can work without setting a, a statement out there that all Muslims are bad. That's really the statement out there. Then today I had a conversation with a Trump supporter. It was very nice. And we're talking. He goes, but I just want you to know I view liberals as the devil. I'm like, okay. I said, so am I Satan? He goes, not you. I go, so I'm the exception now to the devil rule. And I'm like, actually, I am the devil. But 
but I'm like, but I, so this conversation became this weird thing where we were agreeing, and then he goes, you get used to it. We run the Senate in the House. You guys got to sit back. We're going to run things for the next few years. I'm like, you're not really, because we're going to fight all the way. You need 60 votes in the Senate. I want to get into it. But I'm like, <laughs> but so it was two different stories. But the headline is one thing, Trump support or bigot or racist or whatever, or support the Muslim ban, and you find out why. And that guy had talked to him before on my show. He was not a bigot, just fearful for his family. And that was his motivation. So if I can make his family safe, he has no problem with Muslims. And that's really what I really believed in a conversation with him. And that was really helpful. Right. I think, I think one of the problems, I'll just add, and then we'll go to questions, is that I think there are fewer, to go to your, your, your point about your friend, there are fewer spaces for that, those interactions to happen. I mean, there was a time, you know, if you go back to World War II, everybody, or at least all the men, got thrown into the military together. Right, and they had it was this kind of they had these experiences with people of all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, today, you don't have that. You have this tremendous self-sorting in terms of where people live. So people are much more likely to live in ideologically homogenous areas, um, and you also have um, a, a kind of a, a, an elite that has that has withdrawn from a lot of public spaces, whether it be public schools or not not kind of so so you have these it seems to me it's it's hard and then you have on so you know in the media right instead of everybody watching Walter Cronkite or whatever you basically have people in these in these silos where basically literally their google searches turn up completely different set of facts right and their facebook is so it seems to me one of the really difficult questions is in in reality and also in the virtual reality of online where are these common spaces, given that people sort and sort and sort now into smaller and smaller categories? I mean, I used to read, I used to follow the NFL. I don't even follow the NFL anymore. I just follow the New England Patriots, right? I basically have micro-targeted myself down to the only now, so I can basically follow people exactly like me and be part of communities exactly like me. And um, I think it's, um, and whether you can make that kind of interaction profitable, right? I mean, for, for you know, not just, as a, but whether you can actually create spaces that you can actually, uh, that you can create revenue that actually bring people together in conversation rather than further segregating them seems to me a really big, a really big challenge going forward. I hate the Patriots, just so you know. Right, right, right. Really, so we, Tom Brady's the devil. Okay, right, that's the so real we, devil. Right, so we're not unified on sorry. everything. All right. Yeah, um, sorry, we're giant fans. You're like, I, hope, I hope you guys see. I hope you're a Redskins fan because we can team up against no, that's, you. That's, that's, um, uh, okay, so let's go to, let's go to questions. Wow, um, a lot of do questions. we have, uh, we have microphones? I think I see a gentleman with a microphone over there, a gentleman with a microphone over there. So um, why don't you go and uh, just bring the microphone to somebody? H how about, uh, how about uh, to this lady over here? Uh, with the glasses. People in the front all have questions. Look at this. They were really they got here early. Yeah, very particularly good. because you are journalists. Sorry. Um, I would like you to reflect on your responsibility. Uh, because I, my belief throughout sorry, my belief throughout this election, particularly you saved Trump an awful lot of money. Because you covered him all the time. Every time he opened his mouth. He was covered and it was repeated over and over and over again to the point that I was afraid to turn on anything. Uh, you didn't give this, the same... I just I want to make sure we get a, the question. I, I, okay, the question is, what have you learned from your own irrational selectivity? Because to say that Trump comes without any baggage, come I never said on. that. No, 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 but that's sort of one of the In fact, I've said the opposite. Myths. <laughs> she has baggage, he doesn't. Right. Come on, wake right. up. I didn't say that. Whoever said that? <laughs> no one right. said Peter that. Peter said it. Right. No, no, I'm right. not. Uh, listen, it. this is not about you and right. me. Right, right. But so, so, because so, I'm really in right. pain and I'm worried. Right. And I also really understand the power of the media. Right. So the question what is, what have we learned as journalists? Yes. Got it. Got it. Thank Dean, you. you want to go first? Beyond just the I, I would, If I could control what goes on any cable network, it would have been different coverage. It was horribly uneven. Let's be frank. The coverage of Donald Trump, they covered him like a Kardashian the first like seven, eight months. They, and remember, no one asked a tough question. Chris Matthews asked a follow-up. They're like, oh my God, look at this great journalism. He asked a follow-up to Donald Trump. They was like, 
It was fun in games. I think a lot in the media. I'm not defending them. I think he was never, they thought he was never going to get a shot. I was writing articles critical of Donald Trump for CNN last August, not this last August. And I've written 100, maybe 150, every single one, critical of him, calling out his bigotry, the fear, the authoritarianism. Well, everything in there that I saw that was scary, I saw it. I wrote, it's about his anti Semitism, his refusal to denounce anti Semites. Everything. I wish I had a bigger bullhorn. I wish it mattered more, frankly. And I was probably preaching to my own choir. My own friends were sharing it. Other liberals were sharing it. Maybe it reached some independence here and there. And it's getting out of the bubble that Peter's talking about. How do we get our message out to the other people? And we, so I can't do that. I agree with it. Media sucked in this terrible, you know, I said it before, terrible, horrible, irresponsible to no when. So that's part of this where we have Trump. That's part of it. I see. Do you want to jump in? Well, look, I, 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 you can't argue that Trump was overcovered. I won't argue that. Right. The only thing I will say is, if every television viewer were like you, then C-SPAN's ratings would be off the charts, and they're not. And same for NPR and all of your, you know, boutique media outlets that you like that you think are the real journalists, rather than sort of the cable news giants. Not to be crass, but it's a business like any other. It's about supply and demand. There's a demand for Trump. Believe me, if people wanted to see Gary Johnson 24 hours a day, we'd put him on. We'd put him on. And I don't mean we, like, like Dean, I have absolutely no say of, of what we cover. But at the same time, I've, I always find this interesting, the, the, the complaint about what the media reflects back. It's reflecting back what a consumer wants or what enough consumers want. If you hated the way that CNN or Fox or MSNBC covered this election, don't watch them. Turn on other outlets that you think are doing a good job, and if enough people do that, believe me, the cable outlets will respond. Ratings is the currency here. And, you know, I just, I, I don't buy that um, you're this desperate for a new kind of media, because you keep watching. What do you, what do you expect? Just to add, I think it's important to remember that the media is not all one thing. I mean, I think that I actually think that the New York Times and the Washington Post did um, some very, very, very good reporting. Um, David Far David Farenholt at the Washington Post, for instance, devoted months and months and months to trying to, to tracking down painstakingly the fact that Donald Trump had not given all of this charity that he claimed. He should the, get a Pulitzer. Right. It was amazing. The New York Times. And just to be clear, a lot of you know about it because he appeared on CNN all the time to talk about it. Just, just as and, and the New York, the New York Times, a lot, you know, some people didn't like, it, but the New York Times, especially in the latter part of the campaign, really broke with a lot of the he said, she said kind of, you know, template of journalism to say on the front news page, and some Republicans didn't like it, basically pretty blatant stuff about, you know, you know, this is a lie, this is untrue, this is racist. I mean, they actually, I think, really strained against the confines of their own format. I think, you know, I think with TV, just I think one of the challenges is also important to remember is, yes, first of all, Donald Trump was extraordinarily entertaining, right? Secondly, from the moment he entered the campaign, he was the front runner, right? He, because he came in already having had this huge audience from his TV, from being on The Apprentice, he knew him. He was the, so it wasn't like you were covering a marginal candidate. You were covering the guy who, from the moment he entered the race, was leading in the polls, right? And, and the problem was that, I think this is something that Ronald Reagan understood many, many years ago, that Ronald Reagan you know, famously said, I don't care if, you're, if the words being said about me are so negative. If you've got the pictures I want, things, you know, and I think this is part of the problem. And I think one of the reasons, one of the things that hurt Hillary Clinton so much at the end, I think, is that even when people were talking about the fact that she was exonerated from the FBI scandal, the very fact that for low information voters, they were talking about the FBI scandal, hurt her. And so I think this was part of the complexity. I think there were people at CNN and the other networks, too, who also strained to be against the template, to be very, very harsh and blunt about the way they talked about Trump. But in some ways, they were talking about Trump. And that ultimately ended up mattering more. Uh, maybe someone over on this side. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, wait. Someone will come with you with a microphone. Um, I'm very pragmatic. The Electoral College meets on December 19th. The electors can vote for who they want. Is it pragmatic to say that they could say we're going to vote for Hillary because um, she got the popular vote? This is the only thing in the world to do. 
I, don't we wish that? Well, not I don't, all three of us probably would wish that would happen. I'm not sure if I see, but maybe. I've read that you really, really could do it. It's just extremely unlikely. But they yeah. they could. I mean, legally, from what I read, that they could do that if they want. So chose to do that. She might be up by a million or million and a half votes by then. Right. I. I I, yeah, that's true. Right there. All right. So in some, in some, the state rules change by by state in terms of how much freedom you have to you have to you have to do this. I don't think it's, I think I, I think that would be though. problematic in its own way because it would violate the the rules that we assume operate, um, which is that there's an assumption that that the will of the people in the states will be reflected by their electors. But I do think there's a broader conversation, right? In two of the last five elections now, the person who has won the, the larger number of votes has lost. Um, and I think, you know, this may sound like a partisan thing to say as a progressive, but I think that the country is uh, very, very lucky that those two people were um, Al Gore and Hillary Clinton. Because if it had been Donald Trump on the other side, um, I think the, uh, we would be facing a massive, massive constitutional and political crisis um, uh, that, he would have been, that he would have stoked. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I think it's a distinct possibility. Um, and so even if you think that the Electoral College might in some ways make a certain amount of sense, the fact that we have the language of democracy the, and, and the fact that we allow someone who gets fewer votes to win, I think is a ticking time bomb because sooner or later, someone is gonna come along and they're not gonna be as magnanimous as Hillary Clinton and Al Gore were and we're gonna have a, an enormous, enormous crisis and problem um, in the country. And so I think that, I, I think that the really the system, system needs to be rethought. Go ahead, over there. Thank you. Uh, Peter, you touched on it earlier with SE about the uh, Republicans uh, in Congress that might not align with Trump. And to take it a step further, can you envision, uh, in, when Obama took office, uh, Mitch McConnell and others said, we're gonna make him a one-term president even before his first day in office. And it was borne out in the votes in the House and so forth. <clears throat> but there's so many um, never Trump, or anyone but Trump, still Republicans, still in the uh, House especially, certain votes like on immigration and other items. Can you see Republicans not voting <clears throat> as a block in line, in lockstep with the, con the more conservative Republicans? <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you. That's a great question. I think, <clears throat> I think we're more likely to see unity. Uh, I heard from I don't know if you remember David French, who almost sort of didn't run for president, but he was put up by never Trump to maybe run. Um, Bill Kristol had, had wanted him. He's like a writer at the Weekly Standard, National Review, I forget. Anyway, he's a never Trumper, and he was just on uh, recently after the election saying, I don't see how Donald Trump um, embarks on his agenda without the help of never Trumpers, especially in foreign policy circles. There are just too many. So he's gonna need to work with them. And I know a lot of never Trumpers in positions to help who want him to be good, who want him to succeed, and who want him surrounded by people who think like they do. So I think there will be some magnanimity and also some pragmatism within the Republican, the varying Republican caucuses. Look. There are Republicans who are grandstanders till the day they die, right? And they're gonna use this opportunity to you know, oppose or whatever. But I think largely because Republicans won sort of the, the board, I think Republicans as a party are feeling good. Me aside, I feel terrible. But as a party, the, 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 you know, the party feels good and they want him to succeed because it's a reflection on, on the party. Uh, I want to give someone in the back. Uh, <laughs> we'll give, we'll give us a little time. Go ahead, ma'am. Given that we've had a 30-year drumbeat <clears throat> of investigations that have convinced most of the country that Hillary is ethically challenged, what do you predict is going to happen with all of the conflicts of interest with this administration, with Russia, with China, even Rudy Giuliani's ties to Qatar, Mike Pence's problem with his email, what's going to happen? Will that matter or will we not talk about it because we let bullies rule? Oh, 
I wish the Democrats had one chamber in Congress to, to no, there was, to, I mean, I think it was um, Congressman Cummings or, or already sent a letter already about investigation, because Donald Trump, it's, he doesn't want a blind trust, right? He wants to put his kids in charge of it. Um, that's his idea of a blind trust. Give them national security clearance so they can see where his dealings are going. He's going to be paid directly from the Chinese government for his rental property here. At Deutsche Bank has millions of dollars invested there, the Department of Justice doing an investigation. He's invested millions in the Dakota Pipeline, which he's in favor of the Dakota Pipeline. He has holdings in Turkey, in Dubai. I've written about them. He, he loves Muslims over there when he's making money with them. He just doesn't like them here because they don't help him get votes. His business dealings all over. Any, almost any decision he makes could impact his business. If he doesn't put in a blind trust, that's why I'm saying I think he could la leave in handcuffs. It's not because of some amorphous thing. I think, really, he can make some decisions that result in him making money personally. He, we don't have his tax returns, so we don't know every source of income, even though he's supposed to close some of it, that it could lead to his downfall. And if the Democrats at either chamber, they could have investigations into it if something were to happen. So it's going to be up to the media to really focus on him. That's the only way we can do it. So I think that there's something to be there. I'll focus on it. Believe me, if I... I mean, the, the, the question, I think that for me, the, the frightening question is, who's going to take him out in handcuffs? You know, I mean, I mean, which is to say, like, what? I'll do it. You know, a lot of people here. Um, we we oh, operate God. on the assumption, and it's always a little fragile, that um, that the president uh, is not above the law, um, and that there are institutions um, of government that will defy a president, um, and that ultimately those the president will ultimately abide by those institutions, whether they are the Supreme Court, or uh, Congress, or whether it's you know, elements of the own, his own executive branch, if it be the FBI or the, the Attorney General. And, you know, these conflicts have, you know, we've had these conflicts in the past. Um, and so what, what scares me um, is that um, there could be some kind of institutional, constitutional, even constitutional crisis in which Donald Trump says, you know, as Andrew Jackson famously said, you know, when the Supreme Court uh, ruled against him, he said, you go enforce it, right? Um, and... Um, that seems to me one of the nightmare scenarios uh, um, uh, of, of a potential Trump presidency. And I would hope that he's above that. But I can't see, you know, I can't, I can't say that with a lot of confidence be, given his behavior so far. Um, go ahead. You kept talking about Trump. You kept talking about Trump, but you ignored a couple of factors. One of them was that it was a vote against the record of the last eight years. Yeah. And it was a vote against the ideology of the Democratic Party for the last 30 years. And the proof in the pudding is that in some crucial areas, Hillary Clinton got less votes than Barack Obama in 2012. And if not for this, she would have won maybe Michigan, maybe Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Right. So, so you you guys want to want to add it? You know, this why? I mean, in some ways, it's an odd such thing because Barack Obama is quite popular, right? right? And um, Maybe. I mean, I think one of the really interesting questions is, look, the Democrat, Hillary Clinton had not much choice but to run as the successor to, to Barack Obama. She'd been in his administration, and they figured, look, Obama's popular, the economy is recovering, right? I mean, if you look at the unemployment rate, it's significantly lower than it was in 2012 in Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. So I think one of the things that as journalists we really have to try to wrestle with is that there was a some kind of m tremendous mismatch between the, uh, the economic indicators, which showed an economy that was getting better, um, certainly was better than it was in 2012, and, uh, and people who, although many of them like Barack Obama, felt extremely negative about the state of the country and especially the state of the economy. And I think that's a conundrum that journalists really need to try to explain. I don't know where the Demo the question is, where does the Democratic Party go f right forward? Do we go to the center? The progressive oh, so you're saying that we're, we're too far. I thought you were going to say the argument, because in 1988, the argument was well, we have to move okay, no, to the let, center. Let, let, let go no, no, I'm saying, no, okay, I didn't know that. All right, interesting. Okay. 
D Dean respond to that, and then uh, and Keith FD, Ellison, and then we're gonna, we're gonna Keith Ellison, who might be the next DNC chair, who's a Muslim, by the way, he's my friend, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. But uh, no, that's interesting that you think we have to move more left. I thought you were going to advocate moving more to the center because we're too far. So more, the, no, I'm a real hardcore liberal. I just, I was just worried pragmatically. I'm not sure what do we do. I'm, let, I'm at a let, loss. Did, I, okay, let 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 Dean. It, no, it, I, I like what you're saying. Uh, you know, the there was an enthusiasm gap for Hillary, not in the polls. They showed about the same between her and Trump. I talked to young people and other people of different ages, not just young people when I was down in colleges to speak to them, because I'm middle aged and middle aged people were still like, they weren't excited about Hillary. If the Obama coalition came out, she wins. They didn't come out. He didn't overperform. He didn't get a wave of votes. Now he actually has a little bit more votes than Mitt Romney. At first we're like, oh, he got less than Romney. He's getting, he has now, just look tonight before he came here, he has more than Romney, still less than Obama in 2012. So if she got that in way less than 2008, the people were not excited enough to come out to vote for her for whatever reason. They didn't, there wasn't a wave the other side. So maybe it is, obviously the more extreme you go, the more, the more passion you get from your supporters. I just don't know if we go too far and lose any chance of winning. Because we're doing, on a national level, folks, we're doing terrible shape. Republicans have like 33 governorships, two-thirds of the state house, both chambers of Congress, and a Republican president. So, uh, that gerrymandering is a big part of it, but not for governorships. 33, I mean, that's crazy. I, uh, I'm afraid that was going to be the last question. What? Um, the three of us, are, I'm afraid, are going to have to depart the stage quickly. But I want to say, Essie, do you have a quick last, a last word on it? Oh, ju just, just on that point, which I found really fascinating. I, I think if the takeaway from this election is that Democrats need to move further to the left, Republicans are going to win a lot of elections. I just don't think that was the message. That, okay. that this delivered. Th thank you very, very, very much for coming. I look forward thank to you. seeing you at one of these in the future. And thank you to Essie and thank you to Dean.